Welcome back to our studies in the Gospel of John. This is Dick Baker, your teacher, and it is my privilege and joy to be able to share this book with you, some insights into it. And yet, it is a good thing just to read uh, the Gospel of John out loud and just listen to the verses again. So we want to jump into this right now, and if you're following along with us, you can see we're already in chapter 3. Here are the two theme verses together, one thought, uh, that just tie the whole book, and they're almost at the very end of the Gospel of John. And many other signs or miracles truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name, John 20, 30, and 31. So what we have in this book, we have more than enough to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. We don't need to go look for all those other ones that uh, are not mentioned in the book. We have enough just in this one, but there are more in the other Gospels. And then John says, of course, that uh, at the end that he, if all the books of the world could not contain what Jesus did. Here's the outline we're using, uh, ministry to the multitudes. He's with people, the first 12 chapters, usually large groups of people, or at least large groups of Pharisees or Sadducees, religious people. And of course, a smaller group in that his disciples. Then the second session is Jesus does spend his time with the 12 and preparing them to carry the gospel into all the world and to be used of God mightily. In chapter 4, we have the introduction of the Son of God as the love of God to Nicodemus and the front end of the book. And that's who we're going to be looking at today. Jesus and Nicodemus through the first 21 verses then John's ministry at the Jordan uh, involving John the Baptist and some others. So this is about Jesus and Nicodemus, and it's about a sun, a rising sun. Uh, Jesus, of course, is the light, but the light shines in Nicodemus, and he is a rising star or sun within the Pharisees. And uh, this is pinpoints where we are in Jerusalem. So we have uh, three or four points in this lesson, and we can look at them, but I have some extra charts to share with you other than just the Greek and the scripture verses. So we're going to look at concern all at the, at the very beginning. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a leader, a ruler of the Jews, this uh, narrative gets picked up from chapter 2 and the last verse. So really, there's, there's no break in time, and uh, we pick it up from just there and Jesus' confrontation with Nicodemus. Now, who was Nicodemus? Um, we know that he was impressed with the miracles that Jesus had done in the previous chapter, and it says it there. Number two, he's a member of the Sanhedrin. Uh, those, that is the 70 men, uh, the, probably the top religious leaders, and of course the chief high priest uh, is part of that also. Uh, he was religious, he was a Pharisee, studied hard to learn the law. He was well educated, not in just Jewish matters, but his name is Greek, and so he had a Greek education uh, early on in his years. He had influence, he's called a ruler, and he was earnest. Notice his sincere heart. He sought Christ out. Yes, he sought him out at night, but he did seek Jesus out. And so we pick up in verse 2. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Master, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no man can do these things signs or miracles that you do except God be with him. And of course, I gave you the definition of rabbi, master, master teacher. Uh, miracles, here's the Greek word samia, and it, it can be translated signs. Sometimes it's wonders, but most of the time signs or miracles. 
And so this, here's the confrontation, the conversation that goes on. Uh, confrontation is not always bad and heated. Uh, this confrontation is really dealing with issues and asking really the most important questions, pointed questions. So Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of, of God. The word again, when it talks about being born again, it means be, it can read being born from above, and that's true. When we receive Christ as Savior and we experience the new birth, we, we have been born from below, but we are saved from above. And it can also mean that we are born anew, afresh, that we, our sins are forgiven, God's given us a new heart, and uh, we, have a, we have a new everything uh, that lays ahead of us. And so, born, born again, uh, born from above, born anew, all of them are the same thing, but yet touch upon different aspects. But it has to, it's a spiritual birth. It has to come from God. It's from heaven. All right, now here's Nicodemus back again. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? And we understand that he's dealing in physical realms. Again, Jesus, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Now, Jesus is speaking pure truth to him. But the truth is on another level with him. Also, Nicodemus isn't quite picking it up, but Jesus gives him more information as he moves along. So there's always a question. We know that uh, we understand what being born of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God, is involved in our salvation. But there's always been a question about what is the water, uh, born of water of the Spirit. And so here are five uh, actually, there are the five uh, answers or suggestions or thoughts on this. I personally think it's pretty clear, but let's look at all of them quickly. First of all, born of water means to be baptized. Water here that we've read about may, may represent baptism, but there's no real Old Testament foundation for this. So this really comes off the board. In fact, we are baptized because we're saved. Um, after we've been saved, if we're talking about water baptism. All right, the second one is uh, born of water refers to our physical birth. Since we come forth from a sack of water, uh, this approach is, approach is rather more attractive and makes a lot more sense. Um, and it does simply state the obvious. However, the, the objection to this, it does uh, make a good parallel with the idea of that which is born of the flesh. So Jesus is talking what's born of the spirit, which is spiritual. And he in verse 6, we're going to get to next. Um, here he talks about being born of water, but being born of the flesh. That's physical. And so if this is our physical birth, it, it really makes good sense and lines up correctly. So I would say I probably would be here. And I think this would be a safe ground to believe that and to teach it that way. However, here are the other three. Born of the water means to be born again by the word of God. And uh, in other passages of scripture, water represents the word. And it's the word that we're washed uh, by the water of the word. But that is talking about Christians. And that is true. The word of God, one of the, one of the passages of scripture talks and other places talk about the Word of God being water because it does, but it cleanses us as a, on a daily basis. We read the Word of God that it moves throughout our lives, our body, soul, and spirit, and cleanses us. Number four, uh, born of water means to be regenerated by the Holy Spirit, the living water of God. And there is reference there. I cannot argue that, but I don't think that it fits right here. It belongs in John 7. Uh, born of water means to receive the water of cleansing prophesied, prophesied in Ezekiel 36 as part of the new covenant. This approach has the most weight, though it's a tough call, 
because of its firm connections to the Old Testament prophecy, which Jesus says Nicodemus should have known and understand these things. So what he's saying to Nicodemus is, hey, you're a smart man, you've been educated. And he's going to say that you should know all this stuff ahead of time. And so maybe it is talking about, and this probably be my second choice, the water received or the cleansing of it as part of the new covenant, because we still are under law right now. But I believe number two is where, as God's people, we understand it best and would put it there. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not, wonder not, that I said unto you, you must be born again. All right, and I've given you a list here of what being born again means, or what are the the assets and the blessings of that, responsibilities of it, what it does to us. And this is, I, I've given you a pretty good list here of, I believe, 10 things. Um, it's great to study them. And this, is, this would make good preaching. But just to get you started on this, First Peter speaks of being born anew, or again, by God's great mercy. It is by mercy and by grace. Uh, also, in the same book, he speaks of being born anew from an imperishable seed. James speaks of God bringing us forth by the word of truth. Titus speaks of us, uh, as far as being born again, as well, the washing of regeneration. And I'm going to leave these for you to look at and to study and to go through. Barclay, uh, which is one of my, uh, in my bibliography, one of my sources, has some great insights into this. And I need to give credit where credit is due here. So the, these are great pullouts from Scripture and would make uh, really a better in-depth study. So take a picture of this and go study this on the side if you'd like, and it will be a real blessing to you. All right, back to our story. The wind blows where it lists, and you hear the sound thereof, but cannot tell where it comes and where it goes. So everyone that is born is born of the spirit so he says you you can't write you can't touch this stuff nicodemus you've learned it but you're just going to have to believe it it's of the spirit of god and you can feel the wind but you can't put your hands on it you can't explain it but you can't explain how the spirit of god works in people but jesus was trying to point out he's at work in your life now there's confusion Nicodemus and said unto him, how can these things be? And then here's the challenge. It's back, literally, here it is, Nicodemus. It's the ball is in your court. Jesus is answered and said unto him, are you a master, the, ma the master teacher? Are you a great master teacher? He is. And what he's saying is, you are a great master teacher of Israel, and you don't know all these things? You don't understand what the Old Testament says? Verily, verily, I say unto you, we speak that we do know and testify that we have seen, and you receive not our witness. Now, the we, we hear that is speaking is Jesus and the disciples are preaching and teaching this. But the ye that is talked about in the you is Nicodemus and the Jews, especially the religious leaders. He says, you don't want to, you, you don't want to believe what we have to say but you're listening. And he says, you already know about this. Why can't you believe? Really, it comes down to why can't you believe I'm the Messiah? If I have told you earthly things and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? How true. And no man has ascended up to heaven. Really, in the Greek, this reads this way. And no man has gained the heights of heaven. No one has earned his way up into heaven. But he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. So Jesus is saying, all your education, all your religious beliefs to this point, it can't, it's not going to get you to heaven. No man, because of who they are and what they think they have and who they think they are, is going to get anyone to heaven. No man can ascend to heaven. And so, but Jesus says, I, no man has gained the heights of heaven. You can't earn it. But he says, the, man, the one who's come down, me, I am from heaven. 
And here's the clarification in the last verses. Now he goes back and he picks up on something, says, Nicodemus, yeah, let me go and let me talk to you about something you know about. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. We know what's coming up here next, but we're going to look back in the Old Testament at the serpent in the wilderness and what that was about, because now that's in, that's in Nicodemus's mind and he's mulling this through. And Jesus gave him the whole ball of wax. Moses, the serpent lifted up. Whoever looked on it, they were saved. Jesus is going to be lifted up on the cross. Messiah died, crucified. Whoever looks to Jesus and trusts him will be saved, will have eternal life, will live. So going back, here's the, it's about the bronze serpent in Numbers 21. And these are just some statements about this. Uh, bronze is a picture of judgment in the Bible, and it was. God was judging his people. A bronze serpent is a picture of sin, and that sin has been judged. And Jesus was pointing to that. He said, God, God judged Israel over the sin of worshiping false idols and turning from me. This bronze serpent shows that our lost condition and genuine need of God's salvation the serpent, the bronze serpent, wrapped around the pole, lifted up as a symbol of healing and medicine. Jesus healed us on the cross. And lastly, salvation came to the people in Numbers 21 by looking. Nothing else was required. And to be saved today, we need to look to the cross and see Jesus Christ died for us, was buried, rose again. He's back in heaven and if we see him as the, the Savior, the one who died for us and paid for us on that cross and believe we are a child of God, we have eternal life. We've got a great life to live, but we are saved by faith. And so we pick it up once again because I want the lead in verse. And let me go back and let you look at the picture a minute. I should have had that there. That whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Now, get this. Now the Lord's going to expand more. So for God so loved the world. Here's the whole ball of wax, Nicodemus. That he gave his only begotten son, Jesus. That whosoever believes in him, you, Nicodemus, should not perish, but have everlasting life. And I'm going to come back and do a special shorter lesson just on the greatest text, uh, John 3.16. But I'm going to finish this section, and you can look at that if you want to freeze frame and jot it down. That's fine. Uh, but uh, the next lesson I'll do before I finish the chapter will be on this. For God, once again, here Nicodemus is hearing the truth for the third time in the same way. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world but the world through him might be saved. He that believes on him is not condemned, but he that believes not is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. In the name literally implies you believe in him with all his name implies. And when we believe in Jesus, we believe in Jehovah, we believe in all that name that applies. If we believe when we believe in Jesus Christ, we believe in Jesus, Messiah, and all that that name implies. Jesus, our Savior, and all that that implies. And it's far greater than understanding, but we don't have to understand it all. We have to receive Jesus as our Savior. And this is the condemnation that light has come into the world. That's him, John 1. And men love darkness rather than lights. Remember John 1? Because their deeds were evil. For everyone that does evil or foul or bad or worthless things hates the light. Neither comes the light, lest his deeds should be reproved or he receives conviction over them. Stab in the heart. And we close this section by with this word, these, this verse. But he that does truth comes to the light. He that accepts, acts upon that truth that Jesus laid out 
and he's still speaking to Nicodemus, but he's speaking to the world. And says, but come to the truth, me. You come to the light then, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. So God can do a great work in us, but we need to receive Christ as our Savior. I don't think I've made it any plainer today, and I'm going, I'm going to try to when I share John 3.16 in a special lesson. But if you're listening today, do those last verses fit your description? Have you found the light? Have you found Christ? Have you believed in him? If you have an, a hearty amen, and you know the blessings of God that you have through him. And it is joy unspeakable, to say the least. However, if you're not sure, if you don't know, right now, just understand, as Nicodemus had to, his eyes had to be opened. And uh, understand, you are not going to be saved because you belong to some religious organization. And you're not going to be saved because you go to it, or you do good things for, good, for people, good and bad people. You are going to be saved because you bow your head and you pray and ask Jesus Christ to come into your life and your heart, admitting that you have sinned, and pray and receive him. And uh, by doing that, you become a child of God. Stick with me in the next lesson and the one after if you have any questions concerning that because there's more to come. And if you don't get it all there, I think you'll get it in the next lesson with John 3.16. Father, thank you so much for the clarity of our Lord. Thank you for this. This is an incredible story. And it just opens the window for the entire world to see Jesus for who he is. So Lord, I pray that many that have heard my voice know you. But most of all, Lord, I pray that if there are any that have listened and do not know you, that today would be the day of their salvation. May they pray, receive you as Savior. Thank you for the, the grace that you've given me to share in this session and teaching of John. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, God bless you, and uh, please uh, keep following with me. If you're, if you're following as they go up, well, you know I'm doing them live, and they are... I'm not done, of course, but if you see ones ahead of you and even the book done, you know you know that, that it is complete and I've recorded these at a previous time. You can see the date um, on these. Thank you again and God bless you and thanks for listening.